All right. Hey there, everyone. We're back with the Unlocked Explainer track. This track is all about learning and education. Um, we're going to take you step by step through different pieces of essential technology um, so that you can become an ultimate crypto user. Kiara, I just want you to show your face. <laughs> Great. I um, actually so can't. I'll just do a little bit oh, of housekeeping. Maybe. Hold on. There we go. Now I can hear you. Sorry about that. That was my bad. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. I had the I have the umbrella open also so I can keep track of what everybody's saying in the chat and had that audio on. Okay. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. I, again, this is the Crypto Unlocked Explainer track. Um, you, we want you guys to be engaged with us. We want you to play with us. So you can use the Q&A box. You can use the chat box. Um, I myself will be in there answering questions if I can. And then if there's bigger questions that we need our, our speaker to answer, then I will make sure that she answers those too. So here we go. Um, right now we are in a session called What's in Your Wallet, where we, we will be exploring the trade-offs in various types of crypto wallets in an effort to help you all determine which wallet is right for you. So maybe you want to hold Bitcoin forever. Maybe you want zero governments or corporations prying into your transactions. Or maybe you want to trade shit coins all day like a high frequency trader. All of these things are fine ideas. Um, here to help you choose between those wallets is Kiara Bickers. Um, she's the author of a newish book on understanding Bitcoin called Bitcoin Clarity, and she also works with Blockstream. So Kiara, I know you've got um, a big presentation, so take it away. Yeah, how, much, how, many, uh, how many minutes do we got for this whole presentation? We have an hour. We have an hour. So okay, we have 59 minutes. Slow. <laughs> We've got a lot of time. So what I really want to do is, like you said, talk not just about how to choose a wallet, but I want to give you the information to make that choice for yourself. So there's going to be a lot of in-depth explanations as to like what Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to some smaller degree are at a very low level, um, but we'll build up to that slowly. All right, let me share my screen. Presenter view. Okay, can you see that okay? Yep, we're good. Awesome, all right, good to go. Well, welcome to Consensus Distributed. I'm excited to do this presentation for you guys. It's a little bit different than the normal presentation because I'm in my living room, but we'll try and make it work and keep the energy going. Um, if, like like uh, Bailey was saying, if you guys have any questions, do just drop them as we go and I'll answer questions instead of waiting till the end. We'll just do it live. Okay, cool. So this talk, again, like Bailey said, is going to be a, a breakdown of both trade-offs between wallets and what information you need to know before we can actually look at what the trade-offs would be. So I think when a lot of people have decided that they want to buy crypto, one of the very first things they do is try and figure out, well, what wallet they need. I think that's a very reasonable question to be asking. What I want to do for you is instead of just telling you guys what is a good wallet, uh, I want to give you a system for deciding that for yourself. I want to separate the signal from the noise, right? So this is what this slide is about. For me, I think the way that you separate the signal from the noise is you have to define your objective. All right. So if your objective is to figure out what cryptocurrency wallet you want to use, you sort of have to take a step back and say, like, what type of user am I? Right. So even when you just Google this question, you might get answers like Coinbase or Robinhood. Exodus, actually, Exodus is a great wallet if you're interested in holding multiple cryptocurrencies. There's a ton of wallets. That's that's the point. Right. There's a ton of wallets and everyone has an opinion as to what wallet is the best wallet. And I'm not trying to make those decisions for anyone. Uh, I'm not trying to make hard recommendations. I want to give you the information to make that, that those decisions on your own. So what this presentation is not, this is not going to be a one-on-one -on, -one on how to store your Bitcoin because I'm not prescribing you a direct course of action here. Um, this is not a top seven, you know, best of Bitcoin wallets 2020 list. 
this isn't a step step-by-step -step tutorial or guide. Uh, I think that a lot of this stuff is actually pretty straightforward once you understand what would motivate you to choose one wallet over another. I don't think a step-by-step -step tutorial is necessarily the most helpful thing. Here's what we are gonna cover. We're gonna talk about why we care about wallets, like what aspects of them we might care about, what properties of wallets we might care about, why we would choose one over another. We're gonna talk a little bit about private key management. We're not gonna talk too much about that because you could literally talk about that for days. Um, I mean, it's yeah, I don't wanna get into that too much. We're gonna talk about security. We're gonna talk about the different, the basic differences between like regular wallets, the term wallet and, the, and digital wallet. So what are the differences between what we think of as a wallet in the physical sense, like very elementary, and then what we think of as a wallet in the digital sense? We're gonna talk about how you can think about cryptocurrency at different levels of abstraction. Um, in order to understand some of the trade-offs between wallets, we're gonna to need to have a deeper level uh, of understanding about what it, what it is that we're, we just need to have a different level of understanding of the different types of cryptocurrencies and, and what they are at a deeper level. So we're gonna do that with mental models. I'm gonna show you how to use this knowledge to make the right decision for your situation. We're gonna talk about the trade-offs between cryptocurrency wallets, as I've mentioned. And if we have time for it, we'll talk about privacy. Privacy is another thing like private key management that you could just talk about for, on days, for days on end. How to think about Bitcoin so that you can choose a wallet that makes sense for you. So in this slide, I have this like art piece in the background and, you know, th this framing this whole conversation, as I said, has to start with your objective, right? What's your objective in wanting to store Bitcoins or store any cryptocurrency? Because really everyone is going to have sort of different parameters. And although there may be a fixed number of solutions, uh, you need to understand what your parameters are, right? So are you trying to be a user? Are you trying to be a trader, a developer, an investor, a legal specialist, consultant, right? You, you could be any one of these types of people. What I want to do is show you how to be an educated user. And then from that perspective, you'll be able to make educated decisions about what wallet makes the most sense for you and your situation. So again, my name is Kiara Bickers. Um, some background on some stuff that I've done. Basically, I started off in Bitcoin, really interested in Austrian economics, being an economics nerd. And then I was brought into the technical world through working in this industry. Uh, once I started doing like a little bit of programming, I really came to understand Bitcoin at a very from a very different perspective. So my background is mostly just hacking together different projects. I did this like digital identity project. I did this iOS paper wallet app. And then I started working at a company called Blockstream, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. It's a great company. I work there as a system administrator, IT personnel type, type person. I do, I do IT for the company and I enjoy it. So this year I published a book, a new-ish book called Bitcoin Clarity. We got some reviews coming in for that. If you guys wait until the end of this presentation, I'm going to show you how you can get that book um, on Amazon and then also for free at my website. Okay, so getting into the talk. First, we have to start with the magic words, right? So magic words are, <laughs> Bickers and Son does not provide any legal advice, accounting, investment advice. This material is, has been prepared for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide or should be relied on for legal accounting or investment advice. You should consult your own legal accounting or investment advisors before engaging in any transaction. So with the magic words, we can proceed. <laughs> Not investment advice. All right. Don't sue me, bro. Is that is amazing. What I'll like. <laughs> it's really difficult to talk about anything financial without like feeling like I don't want to use the word should ever. So like, I'm just careful. Okay. So did I already show you guys this? I'm not sure if I did. Basically, there are all these different wallets, right? That people will recommend to you. And what I want to talk about before we get into any of this is Bitcoin wallet basics. Okay, so how does a physical wallet compared to a digital wallet? So we probably have more, depending on the, the level of experience for this audience, I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, probably you have more experience with a physical wallet. I mean, if everyone sort of does, right? But these are very different things. So we're gonna talk about how they're different. With a physical wallet, you're holding on to cash directly that has value. Right. When you're holding a, a digital wallet or like a crypto wallet or even just 
you know, your bank account login information. You're not holding the value directly anymore. You're only holding access to it. So in Bitcoin, it's the private key instead of a password that would give us access. Um, sometimes if you're using like a, an exchange service or something like that, then maybe you have a password and they're holding your private key. But at like the level of the, the blockchain as a system, it's just your private key that's giving you access. So you never hold Bitcoins, right? You're only ever holding access to them with private keys. So people tend to think about Bitcoin in a few different ways. They think about it as the market, they think about it as a digital coin, as the blockchain, and as the tool that they use. So I think of this in terms of a scale of abstraction, right? We have things that are very abstract and we have things that are very concrete. I want to focus on this portion here, talking about the coin, the blockchain, and the tool, and get a concrete understanding of what, what Bitcoin is at every level of abstraction there. We won't talk about markets too much beyond the scope of, of wallets. So before I, before I move to that animation, oh, I paused it, great. So private keys are, are how we access our, our Bitcoin on the blockchain, how we authorize Bitcoin to be moved on the blockchain. Now I can call it a key, but first I should explain how a Bitcoin key or a public private key asymmetric cryptography key is different than the physical key that you're familiar with. All right, so a physical key works in this standard way, right? You have a lock and then the key turns one way to lock and turns another way to unlock. I'll let the animation finish, but that's the general concept there. You have one key, one lock, and it does both functions, lock and unlock. In Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, this is just how it works. We split those two functions into two separate keys. So now we have one key that locks and one key that unlocks. So I've explained this so many times already that I think I'm getting better at it, but basically at, like at the core of how you access your Bitcoins, you have these pairs right now. It gets more complicated when you start to talk about things like um, HD keys and how wallets are really working, but just at a high level, you know, you have a private key and you have tons of public keys. Your private key allows you to unlock your Bitcoins that are all associated with those public keys. And your public key allows people to lock Bitcoin on your behalf. Uh, I think calling these keys makes perfect sense. But just before we can talk more in depth about cryptocurrency and wallets, I want to make sure that we understand what these keys are actually doing. Okay, so a private key allows Bitcoins to be spent or allows a cryptocurrency to be spent. So I think I have an animation here. Perfect. Okay, so the private key unlocks my Bitcoin in this example, All right? And then it sends that Bitcoin to another address where I now use your public key. If I'm sending money to you, Bailey, like I'm using your public key to lock up Bitcoins on your behalf, right? So it can get a little bit confusing. And, and this is sort of important if you wanna look at a block explorer you'll, to, to understand what's going on. But this is the general concept, okay? We're just talking about keys. A public key allows Bitcoins to be received by locking the Bitcoins for the recipient. Awesome, I think we understand that. If we, if we don't, feel free to, answer, uh, to ask any questions. So this is how keys are generated. And this is actually pretty important to the concept of wallets because, well, so we're starting from left to right here, we'll just do a little summary before I talk about issues. Starting from left to right, we have this large number or what's called a seed. And I just represent that as dice because essentially this like computerized dice is rolling to generate a very large random number. So this is primarily the developer's concern. Uh, the wallets I use will have libraries to generate large random numbers. Uh, what's relevant and sort of interesting to know is that it's actually very hard for computers to do this. So there are many libraries that don't generate random numbers well. Um, it just nuance, but it, it matters because, you know, someone could accidentally have the same Bitcoin address and that would be really terrible. Okay, so the mnemonic and the word list. So this is the user's responsibility. Once the really large number is generated by your wallet or the underlying library that your wallet is relying on, it's going to map that really large number. If you're familiar, if, if people have an understanding of the concept of entropy, right? It takes that, that entropy, it takes that measurement of the, it takes that large random number and then maps it onto another, another expression, another form of that number. So in this case, it's gonna be human readable words. I mean, the reason why we do this is because being human readable is nice. 
uh, we can write this down, we could take a book out and highlight these words, we could memorize these words, whereas we would never be able to memorize a very large random number. Right, so then this is this is the user's responsibility, and this becomes the tool for reseeding our private key. So let's talk about that. So the private key is is generated from this large number. We have this mnemonic, and most most people who have tried to make a Bitcoin wallet will will realize that it'll have you store these twelve or twenty four words, and that's for this purpose, right? It's because we want to be able to regenerate that private key. Sometimes the mnemonic will have a password associated with it. Sometimes it won't. It's it's up to you. But once you get that private key, it's, it's, not, it's not something tangible anymore, right? All you know is that you have it and that's what you use to unlock your Bitcoin. So it's very important that you keep that secure. More importantly, it's, it's kind of more important that you keep the backup, okay? So anyway, maybe I shouldn't say more important. Also important, it's important that you keep your backup secured safely. Okay, so a, a number of public keys are generated from our private key. Here, I just have one, you know, for simplicity's sake, so it all fit on a slide, but you can generate many public keys associated with a private key. Um, you can look into this if you're interested in HD keys or hierarchical deterministic keys. This was a bit many, many years ago already. And basically what your wallet's job is to, to do all this, right? It creates the really large number. It creates the corresponding mnemonic in your relative language. And then it, relative language, in your language, it stores the private key and then it generates and keeps track of all the funds associated with your public keys. You're probably most familiar with addresses because this is what you actually share in order to get paid, right? So when we were when I was talking about what keys are, what public and private keys are, maybe you asked yourself the question, well, I never interact with public keys. And it's because all addresses are as a smaller, a hashed version of a public key. So what you're actually doing when you're sharing addresses around is your sharing a version of your public keys for someone to lock up Bitcoins on your behalf, right? Cool. Okay, so one of the first trade-offs that we can talk about now that we have obtained this enlightened level of knowledge is we can talk about, we could talk about, do we wanna control our private keys directly? Now, if I was gonna be a totalitarian about this, I would say you always wanna control your private keys. That is the only way to use cryptocurrency, but I'm not. Um, so instead, I'm going to say, sometimes in security, you have to ask yourself compared to what, right? So yes, storing your private key is great if you can store your private keys better than someone else. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's see, how do I organize this? So private keys are just pieces of digital data. Many people, most in fact, don't move their cryptocurrency or their Bitcoins off of an exchange, meaning that the exchange is being a custodial wallet for them and holding those private keys on, on your behalf. And they're doing it for free, which I think is quite nice of them because it's a huge risk. Many people use centralized ex exchanges and never create a real wallet. What I mean by real wallet is they're never in control of their private keys. All right, so the first trade-off that we can look at is, do you, want a, do you want to be the custodian of your private keys or do you not? Do you wanna be self-sovereign in your ability to control your finances or do you not? I'm not making a judgment call about this either way. I do think there are probably cases, like if my grandmother was trying, if my grandmother was trying to buy Bitcoin, I would not advocate for her to control her own private keys because that would just be a recipe for, for, for something happening to her and then never having access to them again, right? So. Anyway, that's a little bit Mormon. We'll, we'll move on from that. The idea in this trade-off is, do you want to control your private keys or not? Do you want to keep your funds in an exchange or not? This, these are the risks in, in having an exchange store your private keys, right? So I have to be, I have to do both sides of this and say, yeah, it's, there are cases where storing funds on an exchange is probably the best case scenario for you, but even though that's true, these are the risks. And I saw when I Googled this, that when I Googled exchange hacks, this was the first thing that came up. And it was a fairly comprehensive list of 49 exchanges. One has happened since I Googled this a couple days ago. And I mean, it's it's bad, right? It's bad. And when I, once we talk about hot and cold wallets, which is up next, I'll explain, um, I'll explain what exchanges do to, to protect your keys. Yeah, so All I right, mean, so, it seems like there's, sorry, just there's a couple no, of questions. Um, 
So it does seem like there's risks on both sides. It's like, if you hold your keys, grandma could lose it and then, you know, never have the crypto again. But if you keep it on exchange, it's maybe also likely that that could happen as well. So I guess this is just a hard industry. I don't really know if that's a question so much as like, there is risks all around. <laughs> there's risks all around and you can potentially be your own worst enemy. Um, you know, there, there's definitely ways to be so secure about a thing you know, you create a password and you create a backup and then you put it in a closet and then you put, hide it in a shoe. And like the next thing you know, like you've lost your own crypto. Um, so right. it's just something to keep in, keep in mind. I think, you know, a lot of the exchanges have really brilliant services where you can do dollar cost averaging, have it take money out of your paycheck. You can buy cryptocurrencies regularly. There's probably a good compromise in you know, having some liquid in an exchange and having some that you don't ever plan on selling, you know, stored away in a more secure fashion as we'll get to later on. Yeah, and there's one more question. This just came in um, from M. Bielstein. Hopefully I'm saying that right. How safe is crypto held on an exchange vault with two levels of authentication, so 2FA? Um, it's kind of technical, but I don't know if you can- No, that's that. awesome. I mean, I. So an exchange vault. Okay. So, so basically like the, what I was going to mention after I brought up hot and cold wallets, since you asked the question, I'll just say it now. Um, exchanges have to tend to have insurance on what's in their hot wallet. Um, I don't think they would actually be able to get an insurance policy on just like all of their cryptocurrency. So they do it on what they have that's hot. Uh, so if an exchange hack were to occur, you can look this up at whatever exchange you use, like what their insurance policy is, how much they're protected for they usually are covered for whatever they lose in hex. Um, that being said, the industry is not as robust as it used to be like many years ago. And there, there's always surprises. So stuff that's in cold storage may not be as secure as we think it is. Um, you just have to do your due diligence and then see what exchange you choose to trust if you're gonna do that. I mean, it sounds like you, know, you are sort of doing that already because a lot of the low hanging fruit of, of being hacked at an exchange is this is a list of all the exchanges that have been hacked, but user accounts get exchanged, it get hacked all the time. And that's nowhere, that's not on this list at all. That would be on no list because that would be like a privacy violation, right? Um, right. But so what your 2FA is protecting against is you getting hacked, your personal shitty password getting hacked. Um, I think that that's great, uh, but there's always still a risk of the exchange itself getting hacked. That being said, they keep a lot of their stuff on cold storage and their hot storage is usually insured. So, I mean, even people who got hacked with the Mt. Gox thing, they got some, I think they're getting some payouts, but it's like not nowhere near the value of what their Bitcoins would be worth today if they had still had them, right? So you take the bad with the good and you make the choices you can. <laughs> okay, so hot and cold wallets for anyone else who's tuning in and watching that isn't aware of this. I think this is a, per we're still staying pretty basic as far as like what we're talking about here. Um, so hot wallets are, let me see, what order did I put this in? Hot wallets are keys in a computer where the data for your private key is on a computer that is connected to the internet, right? So we're on a Zoom call. If my private keys were on this computer, that would be a hot wallet because I'm on the internet, right? A cold wallet is my, the data of my private key is, is on a computer that's not connected to the internet. So the recommended hardware wallet is probably Ledger. Um, I just prefer it over Treasure for reasons. It, basically, Ledger, Ledger is closed source, and we'll talk about some of the vulnerabilities of being open source in a little bit. Okay, so at this point, I've pretty much covered the what I would call the simplistic view of wallets. I think this is, if you, if you were to Google these questions about like, what wallet should I use? That's kind of the general advice that people will put out there, right? Like, oh, never keep your money on an exchange and always use cold storage. And if you did that, it would you'd probably be pretty good. Um, but what I want to do is give a little bit more nuance into those questions. All right. So, so here's a little bit so of history. I'm going to stop you one more time just because there's a bunch of people okay. talking about cold wallets. So, and just so this, um, you know, this, this tints your view of how you, you set, set up the next part of the session, but so it's, uh, Fox Raymond, thanks so much for, for being so open here. I'm very technical, but I'm scared of Bitcoin cold wallets, all these different BIP, BIP, BIP derivation paths, send and change addresses, etc. I'm scared that I will generate 24 word 
mnemonic plus passphrase keep it as a cold wallet yeah and then there's a bunch of people being lol yeah i'm trying i just bought a ledger nano but i'm afraid to set it up and lose all my crypto um, <laughs> bitcoin yeah. equals too scary so there's yeah, there's a lot of interest in this and also like fear in this particular subject yeah, I mean, I think you have to be very brave to take on cryptocurrency, right? And if I were to do a different type of presentation that was just on cool storage, it, the, the first half of it would just be framing about how brave and courageous you are for storing your own funds and how it's the honorable thing to be doing in life. That being said, freedom comes with responsibility and it is hard. Um, one of the things, that, uh, a couple of my friends, I would never do this for people who I work, I wasn't close with, but you know, my, I have a friend who's a preschool teacher who bought some Bitcoin and he's terrified because he had like a 12 word mnemonic and then he goes to bring up his, his, his storage again. And he, no, he had a 24 word mnemonic and the wallet's like, do you want to input your 12 or 24 word? And he's like, well, surely I want to put in my 12 words because it's shorter than 24. And he like thought he had lost all of his money because he was like being lazy about how he did it. Of course he didn't lose his money. So it's a good story, but um, yeah. So what I do for other people and friends is like, Hey, like if you're, I have a trusted friend that knows how to access cold storage for me. You know, if you have a spouse or something like that, you can do it that way. You could have multiple devices, like have two ledgers, put one, you know, not in your house, keep one in your house and make the password something that you wouldn't forget. There are different ways that you could do it. But again, just don't make yourself your own worst enemy with this. Make it something that you feel very confident that you'll be able to, to, to access. That's the best I got for that one. You're brave. You can do it. <laughs> don't worry about Amazing. derivation. Path, though. The wallet is, the, the wallets can handle it. Okay. So a little bit of history. So some people may not know this, but when Bitcoin first started, uh, it was actually it was actually all a network of homogeneous full nodes, meaning that if anyone if anyone wanted to run Bitcoin, they were all running the same. Well, it's, it's kind of hard to explain this, but they're all running the exact same version of Bitcoin that did a bunch of things. Right. So it was a wallet. It was a validating full node. It was also a miner. So that had a lot of implications. But what Bitcoin is now is a little bit, we've pulled out mining from this original stack. So it used to be that this was all full nodes, right, on the left. And then mining was a part of that. And now we have these two separate entities. I think my slides in our weird order. Yeah, this was the original full node as one stack. And then the, the software was just called uh, Bitcoin EXE. So we separated out hardware wall or mining, and then let's see, how do I get to light nodes? So one of the first conversations about scaling Bitcoin was around the idea of, of people wanting to use phones. Okay. And that was in about 2011. So very early on, what was going on at the time though, meant that like, you have to think about what type of user was running Bitcoin back in 2011. These were like very technical people who are very interested in preserving the full properties of the system. And in order to scale into light nodes, there was absolutely no way to do that without compromising a lot of the, a lot of the properties of full nodes. So many of you probably are aware now that I'm hearing some of the questions, I understand a little bit more about where the audience is at. You're probably aware that running a full node means you're connected to the internet full time, right? But having a whole bunch of users connected to the internet full time in order to make a Bitcoin transaction would be very difficult. So when the when the first split from nodes, or excuse me, the second split, because we split from full nodes to full nodes plus miners, and then we split the full nodes again into light nodes. And I just want to talk a little bit about what light nodes are, because I think light nodes are a really good option for people that are, are, are fairly technical and trust themselves and want to get some additional properties of validation that they wouldn't normally get from say like a normal, like just like mobile wallet. Okay. So what the, what a light node is and how we scaled Bitcoin in, in 2011 is it does partial validation instead of full validation. Okay. So basically the, when you run a full node, you're validating the full blockchain. When you run a light node, you're only validating your transactions in a block. And I think that's, that's probably a lot better than using a lot of different wallets that are out there. So my favorite for this is, uh, is called my node. Technically, this is like a full node, but if you actually look at this image right here, it allows you, it has like a super simple GUI, and then you can run an Electrum server and then connect to it with your app. You can do a lot of stuff with this. I, I really like this product. So I would recommend that if you're going to do a light node. It's something I actually don't mind recommending. And it's open source and it's cool. It's a, it's a fun toy. Okay, so what is the difference between a full node and a light node? I sort of talked about that a little bit, but let's just finish it out. 
So a full node validates all the transactions of the blockchain. Some, in some cases, it's storing the full blockchain. In some cases, it's just validating it and then printing the node or printing the chain. Uh, SPV wallets are also called light nodes, are only validating if your transaction is in a block. There are certain security edge cases here where there have been cases where someone has validated that their transaction was in a block, but then it turns out they were on the wrong chain. So there's still edge cases where this doesn't help you. So let me let me let me bring this down a notch. The reason why you'd want to value validate some of your transactions is because you're making high value transactions and you want to know if they've confirmed like quickly. And if you're not validating your transactions, what you could do as an alternative to running a full node or a light node is you could just wait more block confirmations. So once you have multiple block confirmations, you can be reasonably sure that that your your confirm your transaction is confirmed. So the reason why you'd want to use either a full node or a light node is because you want to basically get that confirmation in a trustless way faster. That's the the short of it. Okay. So this is some, this is confusion that some people apparently have. Not all mobile wallets are, are light wallets or SPV wallets. So most of the mobile wallets that people use don't do any form of validation and you're fully trusting someone else's uh, service basically to, to know if your transaction was confirmed. This is an issue for some people making very large transactions and want confirmation right away. If you don't need confirmation right away, this isn't a huge issue. So I'm going to shift into talking about just mobile wallets, okay? So there's a large variety of mobile wallets, some that will act as a light node, some that will let you connect to a light node or your remote full node, some that store your private keys on the device and others that store your private keys on their service with, on their service with their servers. Some that are closed source, some that are open source. You can tell I have dyslexia because I read it backwards every time. And there's a little bit of confusion about the security principles when it comes to open source and closed source. I, I often hear when someone says it's open source, they say it as if it were a synonym for more secure. Um, that is not the case. Um, open source is great. It, it's great for community. It's great for being able to build software um, around stuff that would be hard to monetize, which is the case for a lot of wallets. Like what wallet services do you know that are paid for, right? With, with the exception of being hardware wallets, there really isn't any. So it's very difficult to monetize wallets, meaning that it's really good that, that some are open source because they're community projects that people can work on. Um, but there are problems with that, like major, major problems. So th the risk of using something that's open source is that you have this thing, I'm trying to see where I have my slide coming up here, is that you have this thing called a dependency, right? So here's your app software. Right? And this is just what we think of when we want to look at like, I know bread wallet is something that's open source, right? It's a, it was one of the first Bitcoin wallets that I went to look at when I was developing my own like paper wallet app. I just like looked up a wallet and like, Ooh, which one's open source so I can figure out how these wallets work. They all use, they all import libraries, especially because they're on mobile devices. So they don't, they're not writing all the code necessary for that app, right? They're importing libraries in order for that app to work. They're, they're, they're importing cryptographic libraries. They're importing um, like visual libraries in order to make like the UX really nice and clean. They're just importing a lot of other people's code. So every time you use not just open source app, not just open source code, this isn't limited to open source, but whenever you're using other people's code, realize that you're not just trusting them as the developer, you're also trusting every developer that their code is relying on and unfortunately, once what ends up happening when, when a wallet is open source, although it is beneficial to the community and there are reasons why it's good, the negative aspects of that is that those libraries are public, right? Because if, if, if code is open and I can see what it is, I can see what libraries they're using. And in many cases, this is just one, in many cases, what people will do is look at what libraries are being imported aim to become maintainers of that library and then inject vulnerabilities essentially into the library that that wallet is using. And now they can just like see all the funds. And that's happened multiple, multiple, multiple times. So I'm very skeptical of any wallet that unfortunately is a, is a mobile wallet just because they're the most vulnerable to that. Okay, doom and gloom, be brave. You can do it, <laughs> I'll skip. we'll just gloss over that now and, and, and keep going. All right, so the type of wallets that we've covered so far are custodial wallets versus non-custodial wallets. We've talked about hot wallets versus cold wallets, full nodes versus light nodes, also known as SPV wallets. 
who talked about the different types of mobile wallets and why it's very unfortunate that you probably don't want to use them. And now what I want to talk about is fancy wallets with different tra transaction types. So unlike the previous wallets that we've covered, the difference with what I'm calling the fancy wallets is sort of like these aren't totally distinctly different. Like a hot wallet is either a hot wallet or it's a cold wallet. A full node is either a full node or it's a light node. With these fancy wallets, they're either just enabled or they're not enabled to do this particular feature. Okay, so that'll make sense when I talk about this. But essentially there are, this is Bitcoin specific, but I'm sure every cryptocurrency will have their version of this. And honestly, it's probably the most relevant to talk about it when it comes to Bitcoin, because altcoins that don't have as developed or flushed out of a community We'll just have the same developers that are working on the cryptocurrency also building the wallets. So there's not as many selection choices there. All right, so as it pertains to Bitcoin, we have multi-sig enabled wallets, we have SegWit enabled wallets, and then we have coin join or privacy enabled wallets. And hopefully we'll have time to talk about privacy. Oh, and my computer's slowing down. Yeah, I didn't like that. Okay, so we're gonna go further down the rabbit hole and we're gonna talk about what was first, multi-sig. So in order, in order for us really to talk about any of these things, we need to we need to flesh out our understanding of Bitcoin at the lowest level, which is going to be UTXOs. So we're going to go from a high level understanding of like what is a block, what is a transaction, all the way down to like what is a UTXO and what is Bitcoin script. And once we get to the level of Bitcoin script, then we could talk about the fun the fun fancy wallets of multi sig segwit and and CoinJoin. Okay, so I said this before and I'll say it again: private keys are just data. And similarly, blocks, transactions, and coins are just data too. So interesting factoid is that coins are never sent in the network. Private keys are never sent in the network. The, the parts of the network that is actually communicated from full node to full node are blocks and transactions. Okay, so coins and private keys are, are also just pieces of data, but they do not actually get sent in the network. Okay, so here we're looking at a mental model on the left, and then we have the raw data, which I just have represented here, like a block, okay, uh, on the right. So we have a block. And when you look at this block, because this is just a data, maybe I should also mention that the, the sizing of this is actually relevant, uh, not for this conversation, but it's size proportional to what it would actually be at the, at the level of the at the level of the blockchain. So like the version is four bytes, everything in white is a fixed size and everything in gray is an expandable or variable size. All right, so what I wanna do is continue to dive deeper. So we have the block, we look at the transaction list because the block contains the transaction list. We look at a transaction. You'll see here that the variable part contains inputs and outputs. So a transaction is going to be, it has, it's a, it's a container for inputs and outputs, right? Which is what one of the questions was sort of asking. I won't get into that. Anyway, so the inputs and outputs contain, this is an expanded view, I think. I'm going too fast for myself even. Um, this is an expanded view of inputs and outputs. So the average transaction will contain one input and then two outputs. And then when you actually open up and look inside of an input and output, it contains this thing called script. Um, developers will refer to it as either script sig or just script, but the, the easy way to refer to it is like the inputs contain the unlocking script and the outputs contain the locking script. So now we can relate this back to that earlier conversation we had about public and private keys. The private key is doing the unlocking portion, right, in the input, and the public key is doing the locking portion in the output. So I know I'm going fast, but hopefully that makes sense, or maybe it's even review for some people. So we're going to talk a little bit about script because that's how you make up different transaction types, and that's how we can build up to talking about the fancy transaction types and what, you know, if wallets enable them or not. So Bitcoin script is just the instructions for locking and unlocking coins on the blockchain. This is what it looks like kind of zoomed out. The way that script works is it takes data and then it operates it, it operates on it with functions, right? Those functions are called opcodes in Bitcoin. So recall the, the diagram that I showed you about how the private keys were being generated, right? We had this, this large random number. I'm excluding mnemonics because it's not relevant for this. But from the private key, the private key can generate either more public keys or it can generate a signature. Right, so the interesting relationship between these two is that, um, well, basically the, the signature, if you have the signature, you can verify that it's related to this private key. That's why they're at the same level here. The public key can generate an address. Okay, so these are the pieces of data that Bitcoin script cares about. 
Oh, and my computer is angry again. I don't know how many slides it skipped, just one. Jeez, you'd think you'd be able to handle PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> so made a little bit more pretty. These are the pieces of data that the blockchain or that Bitcoin script cares about. And opcodes are the functions that act on this data. So the opcodes in combination with different, basically using different opcodes or different functions, that's what creates different transaction types. Um, we're not going to go into every single transaction type because that would just be, there's no point, but one, and then use that to, to basically carry over our understanding to, of the others. Okay. So this isn't code. This is just like, basically, this is just how script operates. It operates in what's called a stack. So on the left-hand side, we have this unlocking script, and then we have a representation of the, the signature and then the, the public key there. It operates, the locking script operates on the unlocking script. It, it's very bizarre to me that like, it's actually the locking script that acts on the unlocking script. Anyway, you probably have to like stare at this in order for that to make sense to you too. But for reasons, all of the functions are in the locking script. So when your Bitcoins are locked, the Bitcoins are locked with the instructions of how to unlock them, right? Bring me this data, bring me the data of the, of the signature and the public key in order to unlock me. Okay, so it operates like this, right? So we have, let's see, operates on what's called a stack. We have op dupe going first, so that duplicates the public key. And then we have op hash 160, that takes the public key and creates a hash, right? Because we said the public key can be turned into an address, which is just a hash, as I'm showing here. Let's see, will it allow me, oh. It's thinking. <laughs> Still thinking. I swear I'm not running anything in the background. I am, but I don't know that that matters, right? No, no, it's definitely my machine. Just let's do a five second countdown and if it doesn't, I'll, I'll kick it. <laughs> hmm, I guess that kind of was five seconds on. One second here. Cheese. Oh yeah, Kiara, you froze too. Oh, there you go, there oh, you go, there you go. go. You're good. Let me yeah. try this. One second, I'm gonna end this slideshow and then try, I realize I do have something on in the background. Let me close that. If anyone has Just, any questions, now's a good time. Yeah, there are some questions actually. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, well, there was, you know, some complaints about SegWit, so SegWit wallets and then trying to transfer money and then the exchanges don't actually accept or support SegWit transactions, so that kind of sucks. Um, oh, what exchanges don't accept? That's rude. <laughs> so I think there are still ones that don't, uh, that don't support SegWit, um, although let me ask him. Uh, um, I think it was at minute 35 something like that so that was another fox raymond uh it's coming with comment. the um and then there's also comments about um or questions about attempting to educate people about cryptocurrency um we can just wait till the end for that but i'm sure you have some thoughts there so yeah okay. we'll make sure to answer that at the end okay yeah i'll t i think the problem with segue i'll save it for when we actually get to that um Okay, so again, we're just operating from left to right. We have uh, op equal verify. We have this check sig. I'm just speeding through it at this point, but you you get the idea. You get the idea. This is sort of how Bitcoin script works. And all full nodes do this. Okay, so they're sort of, uh, it takes time. It takes time for full nodes to validate transactions. The reason why I chose um, P2PKH as the example transaction that I wanted to do is because most of the transactions on the blockchain are stored in that type of output. Okay, secondary uh, as being the uh, secondary most second most common type of UTXO is the P2SH. So for reasons, the multi-sig that's built in the Bitcoin is just like totally broken. So everyone uses P2SH to create multi-sig. For people who aren't familiar with multi-sig, the reasons why you would want to use it are this, right? So we've talked about why, how UTXOs, motorcycles, sorry, 
Um, we've talked about that basically these, these UTXOs are just instructions for locking and unlocking Bitcoin on the blockchain. When you can do basically like fancier locks with pay to script hash, um, the most common type of thing that people will do with it is just a multi-sig. So you'll say, uh, you can set up, let's say, I don't know if this makes your, your cold storage recovery more or, or less complicated, but um, you could, you know, get together with your friends and family and say like, hey, only, only three of five of us are required to move these funds. Or maybe you don't have as many friends and you say two of three. It's like three of you get together and then two of you decide like, okay, we're going to move these funds. If the third person, the, the, the third person doesn't need to be privy to that transaction. But there's trust involved in setting things up like this. You could also use to you could also use uh, multi-sig to set up your own personal 2FA. But for me, that would make things more complicated. For other people, it doesn't. Um, you just kind of have to decide what works for you. But that feature and that functionality is there on multi-sig enabled wallets. Okay, so these are some of the multi-sig enabled wallets. I find that the easiest is Copay. Unfortunately, that also means that it's a mobile wallet. So you'll see now why they're, the trade-offs are kind of complicated because there's like reasons why you don't want to use mobile wallets. And of course, the easiest multi-sig enabled wallet to use is going to be a multi-wallet, uh, a mobile wallet where you can just like scan the QR codes and it's just got a great interface for doing it. Um, you can make your own choices with that. All right, so SigWit. So the reason, like, unfortunately, it's probably true. I didn't realize this was true, but it probably, it sounds like it would be true that some exchanges just don't support SegWit. SegWit was sort of political in weird ways, which is why like some, some companies are just like holdouts to it. Um, I think people don't really understand it still to this day. Uh, people wanted bigger blocks and SegWit was uh, sort of the proposal instead of bigger blocks. And people are still upset about that, which surprises me, it's been so many years already. Nevertheless, SegWit is apparently not universally accepted. It is accepted at most um, at most places. Most most places will accept SegWit and do allow for SegWit transactions. That being said, I should probably mention what SegWit is. SegWit is a way to have lower transaction fees, primarily. That would that would it, SegWit was a proposal to Bitcoin that changed a lot of things. But for a consumer, the the reason why you'd want to use it is because uh, if you if you recall, I showed that UTXOs have a certain amount of data that they take up on the blockchain. SegWit addresses take up less space on the blockchain, meaning that because they take up less space, they require less storage, they're less of a burden on the network and it's cheaper to make those transaction types. Uh, they have less fees. That's just the short of it. So these are all the wallets, that, not all, these are a lot of wallets that accept SegWit, obviously Bitcoin Core, but then you also have things like Copay in here again. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's pretty widely adopted. And at this point in time, we can actually do privacy. Do we have time to keep going with privacy? Yeah, we can keep going with privacy a little bit. Um, yeah, they, I think it was, what do you say? Blo uh, Exchange.blockchain.com um, was the oh. one that wouldn't receive, was it, let's see. They won't send to SegWit addresses, but they'll receive SegWit transactions, supposedly. Yeah, they, them specifically, uh, it escapes me what BIP this was, but th that company actually had a proposal that was counter to SegWit where they wanted their proposal to win instead and it got kind of like ugly and political. And their proposal allowed, it basically made it so that Bitcoin payments could choose to be accepted or denied. Um, that was that was actually disabled in Bitcoin, so it was accepted and then people had to roll it back and like people got really upset about it. About it. And this is why. You know, politics yeah, is a mess, yeah. which is why Bitcoin just shouldn't be political. And if you don't right. change anything, there's no politics. <laughs> there's also, so there's also a question about um, bread wallet. Just what do you think about it? I know you talked about it earlier, but I think this person maybe came in a little bit later. So Adam Green. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, I talked about bread wallet. I think it's a, a great open source project. I would not personally use it partially because it's open source and partially because like, I don't really like to use mobile wallets. So I wouldn't, maybe the, the, yeah, I think that's probably it. I just wouldn't use it. And the, sorry, the, the open source wallet or the mobile wallets you're hesitant about mainly because I want to make sure I told somebody else correctly, but mainly because they're using libraries that could be embedded with exploits in them. And yes, and because they're open source, it's possible to know what those libraries are. So like, if you're closed source, no one knows what libraries you're using and it's your, it's like one less attack vector. Right. If you're open source, 
So the reason why it's mobile and open source is because mobile tends to import way more libraries than if you were just like building a standalone um, or even just like less trusted, more community organized sort of libraries where if you're building something on a desktop, like you're probably using fewer libraries and the ones you are using are, are more robust, trusted, have been security reviewed to a greater extent. Those are okay. huge assumptions that I'm making, but yeah, that's the, that's the answer. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's go on to privacy. There is a question, what is what are the best secure wallets? So like, you know, keep that in mind as you're going through this privacy one, um, or if you wanna answer it now, feel free. Yeah, the best, the, the, the most secure way to store your funds is just with the cold storage hardware wallet, just easy, you know? Um, like the other person had asked, it's sort of scary to do it because it's like you're really in control of that and you have to be sure that you're not at risk, putting yourself at greater risk of losing your funds. But that that's definitely the most secure way to do it. The only, the only real vulnerability there with hardware wallets is if someone gets in contact with the wallet directly. Um, I believe there was some vulnerabilities exposed with, I can't remember which of them, it was probably Treasure, I think, that maybe Ledger too, that if you got if you had physical access to the wallet that someone could get access to your funds just by having it. So you have to like get a hardware wallet. Now it's not online, which is great. Um, and then in, you have to sort of store that also like behind a safe or, you know, like under your floorboard or something like that. I don't know. Depends on what your, what your risks are. Okay. I'll move on and we'll just talk maybe 10 minutes here about privacy. Okay. okay. So I think privacy is a fun one to talk about. So exchanges are core to understanding how privacy works in, in the Bitcoin space, because it's like, okay, we talked about the data on the blockchain. We talked about private keys, even signatures, UTXOs, blocks, transactions, like all that stuff. But we, the, the context in which that all lives is in a network, right? And the network is like transactions are happening and people are watching those, the transactions that are happening on the blockchain. When you use an exchange, they know who you are. So I'm going to explain how, how this stuff works. So exchanges are businesses that have to conform to the rules and the regulations of the state that they want to continue to operate in. Obviously, this means that when you make this means that they're forced to make reasonable et efforts to show that they use KYC. What, are the, what else? They use C, all these acronyms, CFT, AML and money laundering stuff. They, they have to make sure that you're not a criminal. OK, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like if you want exchanges to exist, this is what they have to do. If you appear like you've got something to hide, they will ban you without thought and you'll never be able to use them again. So in the US, I actually don't care about this too much because if one exchange bans me, I can use another. Um, but you know, I may like the exchange that I use and, and I don't wanna be banned. So there's just something to, to consider when you start to go down the privacy rabbit hole, right? Because a lot of people will just say you should use privacy preserving stuff all the time. And I wanna just take the other side of that and explain what the risks potentially are there. So this is how the industry in my mind works, right? I think about it like this. Users need exchanges. Exchanges need the, they need the rule of law in order to be allowed to operate, okay? And in between that is the analytics software, the analysis software, the, the spying software, okay? And I, <laughs> I'm not mad that these things exist, but this is just what they are, okay? So what these companies do is they, let's see, what do I have here? These are like, this is like their mission statement or something like that. They want to link the real world entity. So you as a person to the transactions that are living on the blockchain. And again, nothing wrong with that. I'm not making a judgment statement, but if you want to be private on the blockchain, you just have to be aware about how these things work. So the business model of these analytics companies, these analysis, blockchain analysis companies, what how it works is that they'll say, they'll go up to a cryptocurrency exchange and say like, hey, if you want to comply with KYC and anti-money laundering laws, you will have to use our services or you will go to jail. And they go, don't worry, it's totally the standard. Everyone does it, so just do it. Buy our software, right? It's, it's, it's like, it's a little aggressive, but that's what happens, okay? And the exchanges uh, begrudgingly go, oh, okay, I guess I should do that. And then I get compliance. I don't have to worry about the government breathing down my neck. So I'll use one of the standard softwares, okay? Now, the way that the exchange operates is that in order for them to look up any information about a transaction, they first have to give up the data they have about that transaction. That's the key portion of it. So if you bought your funds at an exchange and the exchange, like, let's say you bought like some Bitcoin or 
better, you're depositing Bitcoin, right? So you're depositing Bitcoin at, at an exchange and they want to make sure that you're not some terrorist, you're not laundering money, you haven't stolen that money in a recent hack. They're going to look up the information about that transaction first. Okay. And then once they look, I mean, they're going to take your money first, but they take your money and then they look up your transaction and they see like, okay, what is the history associated with the, they usually call it like data clusters, right? Like what's the cluster of information we have about this address? And usually there's a lot more than you'd expect. So the data that exists on the blockchain, things like the block timestamp, the input address, output address, transaction values, change address, address types, IP address, this all leaks information about your legal identity. Okay, so the obvious stuff that these uh, analytics or analysis softwares are going to be tracking are addresses that are known from a hacking incident. So there's tons of different hacks, you know, like I think one is like, you know, they steal all of the documents on your server and then they inject some code onto your to your computers and they say, unless you pay us in Bitcoin now, then, you know, you're never going to get all your documents back. Like that's just one example. And then they'll show you a little address, right? And like a lot of times people report those addresses, you know, these companies collect that type of information. So they have information of where stolen funds uh, were, were sent to. Underground dark markets, if you've ever post, like if any, if any address was open to the public internet, that was 100% has been scraped and is being collected by these companies. Addresses are flagged funds. I'm trying to figure out what I'm talking about here. Addresses are flagged if funds are coming or going to. Okay. So coin join. So coin join is a, is a way to, I should probably explain what they are before I talk about how these things are tracked, but coin join is basically just a, it's, it's a way that you can in Bitcoin or even some, gosh, there's so many tangents here. It's implemented in some cryptocurrencies directly, whereas in Bitcoin, it's just at the wallet level. But you basically can put all your funds in with other people, and then it comes out mixed on the other end. So it's very, these these companies track the, the chain of how your funds are being sent. Um, they, track, they track change addresses. Different wallets will have different ways of sending funds. They'll have different types of addresses that they're using. Uh, so there's there's a lot of information that's leaked in a typical transaction, but when you're using CoinJoin, what you're doing is you're basically being extremely loud that you don't want anyone to trace you. You're just like, you just throw all your coins in a room full of a whole bunch of other people with your coins, and then you all pick up exactly the same coins that you came in with and then hope that no one figures out which coins were yours. Whew. Anyway, so if you're using <laughs> CoinJoin, it's something that they're paying attention to. Like you're not, you're being noticed when you use CoinJoin. Uh, the best way I could describe it is really like, you're just being extremely loud and hoping no one hears you. Like you're just screaming. And like, maybe, you know, I can't make out what you said, but anyway, I'm gonna move past that. If you're coming from a known terrorist financing address, obviously those are flagged. A known ransom payout address, obviously those are flagged. And the, the, I guess the more interesting portion of this is really like, what can you do about it, right? And like, I care about privacy, so I don't, I don't mean to act as if I don't. I actually really do care about privacy, and I'm a realist about it. I know it's very difficult, especially on like the pu public ledger. Um, so what you can do is you can just, I'm going from simple to more complex here, but you could just simply decide not to reuse addresses. That's like very, very basic. And if you did that, you would improve your privacy a lot. Um, you could be careful not to publish information about your transactions publicly. So I'm so sorry, whoever you are, I didn't mean to throw you under the bus, but doing stuff like this, posting your full name, the date that you bought Bitcoin and the price you bought Bitcoin for is like, I now know exactly which transaction is yours. And I could probably figure out not just which transaction is yours, but you know, what wallet you were using and I could follow your funds and how much funds you have for now until, you know, until you decide to wise up, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate that this tiny little privacy leak can, can say so much. So things that you can do, again, you can avoid using mobile wallets that are more likely to leak personal data. You can consider sending values and non-round numbers. This is sort of a weird one, but you know, when you do things like this, I mean, that's not exactly a super round number, but let's say you buy like 10,000 US dollars of Bitcoin. It's not gonna be a round number in Bitcoin, but you, these, th this software is 100% trying to figure out what currency you're using so they can have a general idea of where that transaction is coming from. You can consider using a VPN or Tor to hide your IP address. You could buy and sell Bitcoin in cash. Uh, that's kind of getting pretty extreme, right? But it's something- Like the old school days. 
Yeah, right. You figure, am I going to get robbed today? Who knows? Let's see. Let's go to the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, we used to do it at um at the park, Union Square Park in in New York. Yeah, it was. I used to do it in San Francisco and Berkeley, and I'd go to a coffee shop, and the guy who I'd buy Bitcoin from there would just sit there all day, and he would just buy from me and sell from another, and sell like he would just flip it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Sorry, Kira. I just looked at the time actually, so they're they're like counting us down. Like one minute, one oh, minute. No problem. Um, we can, we can go. You do have um, some more questions sort of about cold wallets and stuff. Um, I'm assuming, do you want to give out um, somewhere where people can get a hold of you if they have more questions? Okay, I didn't think that would take a whole hour, but here it is. So yeah, if you guys want to find out more, you can go to my YouTube channel. I've created a short link for you there, or you could just Google my name, Kiara Bickers. You could be one of my first hundred subscribers, so that'll be fun. If you want to get the book, it's free on Kindle. You can do that by searching Bitcoin Clarity on Amazon. That's only the ebook, the paperback book you have to pay for with, with Amazon. If you want to get it for free and you're in the US, you can pay for shipping and you can go to my website at getbitcoinclarity.sale, type in the coupon code consensus2020 and then get the book for free. The last thing that I'll plug in here is this. I don't know how anyone's going to remember that many links. Well, just essentially, send, me all the, send me all the links and I'll put them in the chat. Perfect. Okay. I'll send you all the links, but you can go here and I put together just like right before this presentation, a little like self-assessment test and it'll basically funnel you through which wallet makes sense for you based on a couple questions that you answer so that's it thanks for cool thanks for hanging this presentation yes, thank, it's been you. Fun. thank you guys so Perhaps. much um there's another unlock session right after this so uh stay tuned guys thanks Kara.